The only emotion I felt was probably rage. I was numb, actually. It was, uh, it was depressing and sad. It was hard. It was very hard. Join us today as we explore a variety of emergency situations that could happen to you. We'll see how people just like you dealt with their healthcare emergencies and speak to professionals on how to better prepare for a variety of emergencies that could strike you. Welcome to Expats Everywhere, the channel that helps you with moving and living abroad, giving you recommendations, resources to make it happen. On November 17th of 2021, I had a heart attack and that's why I needed medical assistance. I had basically a five day heart attack. It started with chest pains on November 12th and by the 17th, I realized something was very wrong and our neighbors assisted us and called 112 for us, even though they do speak English. So we really didn't need uh, Portuguese friends to help us, but it was great that they did. They took me to a public hospital uh, called São João, which apparently has a very renowned cardiac unit in Portugal. I got an angiogram immediately, uh, had no blockage, no plaque. It turns out I had a heart attack. In layman's terms, it's Minoka, which is basically a heart attack without blockage or plaque. I was diagnosed with stage three invasive ductal carcinoma, which is cancer of the milk duct, breast cancer. I was diagnosed on December 16th of 2022 uh, via email. We arrived on October 6th. About two weeks later, I felt a lump in my breast and uh, went in to go see a doctor. From that time to December 16th, uh, all of the investigative work was done for diagnosis and that's when I was diagnosed. So I had had a degenerative disc disorder for a little over a decade, and I herniated one of the discs in my lower back while I was in the United States preparing to move to Portugal. We were here for less than four weeks when I was unable to function well enough that we made the decision to um, schedule a surgery. The only emotion I felt was probably rage. I just couldn't believe that I was actually having a heart attack five months after moving to Portugal. During that time, nothing of concern only because uh, the females in my family have a history of cysts. And so it was so surface and round the lump was that I thought that that's what that was. I was not overly concerned, um, except for that I was very, very fatigued and had not um, gotten over jet lag from it had been a few weeks at that point, and so I was a little concerned about what my health was doing, but I did not think it was anything of concern at that time. I was numb, actually. It does, it's very surreal. It doesn't feel real at all. Um, when you read a diagnosis, it's a little bit like an out-of-body experience where you know what that means, but you don't feel sick. You don't feel ill. So it's really difficult for the brain to process that you do in fact have cancer. Um, this is what's happening in your body and you will now have a journey ahead of you that no, there's no manual for. So there's nothing to prepare to you emotionally. Um, you know, if you have a spouse or family member in the room with you, it's a lot of staring at each other, <laughs> uh, not knowing really how to process this. So processing it does take time. It can take weeks. It can take a, you know, however long it needs to, to really um, embrace the reality, uh, the new reality of a new situation in your life. A great deal of humility, pain, immense pain, not only chronic pain, but just um, waves of um, debilitating back pain. And so most of my emotions were revolving were around my inability to function in my normal capacity uh, in regards to my wife, my own life, and what we came here to do, which was to enjoy Portugal and travel more. It was, uh, it was depressing and sad. It was hard, it was very hard. So when I arrived at the hospital, they wheeled me right into the emergency area. I went in for an angiogram right away. Uh, that's where I found out I had no blockage or plaque. They didn't need to put stents in. All the doctors that I dealt with were English speakers and they were female, which was really interesting to me, young female doctors, and they were great. So if you go through the emergency number, which is 112 here, uh, they immediately take you to a public hospital. 
So when I was at the public hospital, I tried to tell them I did have private care through Medish, and they really just wanted to see my resident card and if I was already in the SNS system. Other than that, I was never asked about billing. I was never, it never came up. I used the private healthcare system here. I had a fellow expat friend here who was already within the private healthcare system and had a general practitioner who introduced me to their general practitioner. So I was able to contact um, the hospital and make an appointment with the general practitioner in order to get an appointment and get the investigative treatments rolling to find out what was happening. I had a pretty good idea that surgery was going to be required, but we still went through the full process of getting x-rays and CAT scans and going through a few consultations um, to confirm that it was absolutely necessary and it turned out to be a pretty classic case of a herniated disc. We went to a private hospital. Uh, we used a exclusively out-of-pocket payment system for the entire healthcare scenario. So we did have insurance, we do have insurance, uh, however, the insurance that we selected before we came here did not include for a specific amount of time uh, pre-existing conditions, and so they would not cover the surgery, so we paid out of pocket. So my wife and I decided, uh, based off of information that we gleaned from your YouTube channel, to use a concierge healthcare service, and they did absolutely everything for us. We were in touch with them when I injured myself in the United States, and they were absolutely phenomenal in getting us prepared and connected to the appropriate uh, medical professionals, making all of the schedules for us, uh, communicating with everybody, uh, absolutely doing everything for us. It was, uh, it was phenomenal. I was in the hospital for a week. Uh, they didn't want to let me out because they couldn't figure out why I had this heart attack. I did get asked a lot of questions about um, had I done any drugs recently and you know, I didn't know if they wanted me to confess things from the 80s, but they said no, it had to be something that was very recent. And it turns out I had taken over-the-counter allergy medication that had ephedrine in it, which is what triggered this uh, event. But I was there for a week. Everyone was extremely kind. Most of the staff spoke perfect English. Uh, there were some people that didn't speak English very well, but... I had no issues communicating. I have vegetarian diet and uh, they were very accommodating. Honestly, I had, you know, a very nice experience. They were very comforting. The most excellent care I think I could have ever asked for. I'm not only impressed, but really blown away uh, by the kindness, by the warmth, by the types of treatment. Um, very different from the cancer patients in my life and the treatments that they had experienced in the United States where I'm from. Here, it is a lot more gentle, even though I still deal with side effects and symptoms and, you know, everything that goes with chemotherapy and, um, and treatment and surgeries and radiation and what have you. I'm still able to function. I still have my capacities and capabilities. My experience with chemotherapy here is very different from that of those who have experienced it in the United States. And so I don't have a lot to compare it to other than my own personal experience, but I'm very, very pleased with the, with the care that I have received here. And I feel like I am in incredible medical hands. I don't want anyone to fear, you know, having an illness or um, having cold flu or anything like that here. You will be very taken care of. The medical is very, treatments are very advanced here. And I did not know when I first arrived to Portugal that cancer treatments, they were known, this country is known for their cancer treatments and their advancements. So um, I was at the right place at the right time for a diagnosis like this. And I feel very, very fortunate and very blessed. It's phenomenal. It was unbelievable. It was beyond our expectations. Uh, the level of healthcare that I'm familiar with in the United States was provided by a government institution based off of my military service. And so what I'm used to is probably not what a lot of, let's say, wealthier Americans might be used to. I have been to some places with my wife who had better health care than I did in the U.S. The health care services here are at least as good as the best in the United States. And I'm not saying that lightly. The 
healthcare professionals are not only professional, competent, appropriately educated, licensed, but most of them have traveled outside of Portugal for their educations, for internships or additional training, and they all spoke a high degree of English, not just conversational English, but also professional um, medical terms as well. But even maybe more importantly than that, in my opinion, is that they had a great deal of compassion. The uh, healthcare professionals were above and beyond what I could have expected just from um, very brief interactions with, the, uh, with all of the individual providers, whether that was the nurses or the administrators of the financiers, all of which we worked with um, through our concierge healthcare service. Uh, they were wonderful. They were warm and dedicated to what they were doing. I was surprised at how many women are doctors in Portugal. I was surprised that we have yet to receive a bill. I don't want to say it was free because I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, as of now, we've still not received a bill. And I think I was not surprised, but I was very appreciative of the level of care that I got and that they were so good about communicating with me what was going to happen, you know, each day kind of thing. And um, yeah. I think what surprised me was the way that uh, the communication was in regards to how from the beginning to the end, the doctors they're very kind and they're very gentle and their tones are wonderful. They all spoke English, which is very helpful because I just arrived to Portugal, so I don't speak the language fluently. They did not handle me with kid gloves. They treated me like an adult, which I appreciated. They gave me all of the information and they held my hand. They're not afraid to touch you. You know, there was a lot of, you know, hugging and a lot of human contact. And I was very impressed by that. It was, it was a very warm environment and they understand the stress of the situation. I was very surprised at the um, high level of English spoken by everybody. I was also very pleasantly surprised at the high level of technologies that they had available for the services that I received, the cleanliness, the orderliness, the mo modernity of the hospital, and honestly, the interactions with all the healthcare professionals as well. Everything was really, really smooth, um, maybe even more that I was surprised with was how affordable it was. And I'm not saying that because we came here expecting to have this because I had healthcare back in the US. But when we were told the price, it was magnitudes less than what I thought it would have been for an equivalent surgery back in the US. I mean, it was many, 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 many factors less. And for us to be able to pay out of pocket with an international credit card on the spot for the entirety of the service, which included x-rays, CAT scans, uh, I think five or six uh, doctor's appointments, the entire surgery, which was included anesthesia overnight in a, a hospital room of my own, that was really surprising as well. I've had, honestly, fantastic uh, experience with the private and the public uh, healthcare system here. I was assigned a cardiologist uh, who I had not met in the public system, who is now my cardiologist in the private sector. And he's fantastic. He's been very communicative, uh, very understanding, and you know, I couldn't ask for a better person to have at my side. My advice is to make sure that you are completely prepared with insurance. Um, when you arrive here, whether it's a various type of visa, there is usually a travel medical insurance that you have to obtain. Um, in order to be here, make sure that um, it is at least six to six months to one year a span of time to cover you. As soon as you arrive here, please obtain um, through various concierge services like AFPOP or Serenity um, a private health care plan for, to protect you as well until you go through your CEPH appointment and become an official temporary resident. It will protect you whether it's medical, vision, dental, and there's also a waiting period with those policies. So any type of preparedness insurance that you have will back you up during that time and just make sure that you are prepared and that you have everything that you need to support you during your transition because we never know if you twist an ankle, if the hammer may fall or 
anything like that um, can happen. There are cobblestone streets here, so <laughs> if anything happens, you are covered. I would say if you have it in your budget, at least exploring the option of using a concierge healthcare service would be something I would definitely look into. We certainly got our money's worth out of that service and we signed up for another year. Additionally, I would say take as much time as you can afford yourself based off of your timelines to dive as deeply as you can in each of the ma major healthcare providers. While we're still very happy with the one that we selected, it just didn't quite work out as well as we had hoped for ourselves. We don't regret choosing that and, and we're still very happy with who we chose, but if you can take as much time as you need to explore who would best serve you should something like this arise. A very frequent question that we come across is what if? Very simple, but a very important one. And this what if is always about what if I die? What if something terrible happens? What if I'm just left alone? And this preoccupies our clients and actually preoccupies us because we, at the end of the day, have to provide answers and solutions. And looking into this matter as, you know, from above is actually thinking of dividing the solutions into three or four parts. The first one will always be professional. The first one will always be medical. What medically can be done? And this... This is what we do for a living, so it's like, you know, it's okay. We will find a solution, we will find uh, the proper physicians, we will find a proper hospital, we will find a proper uh, team to treat a patient that is a need. The second one is everything about operations, everything about logistics. I'm alone in Portugal, or um, we are a couple and uh, my spouse is now hospitalized. I can't even reach the hospital to bring her the charger or the computer. And we're working on a solution of that as well. But then, when you look into long-term support of clients that might need of patients, that might need home care, that might need a nursing home, that might need complex, prolonged support, uh, we need to look into some legal and some financial solutions as well. Legal, because uh, as an example, person should assign somebody to be his, um, to provide him a power of attorney in a way, responsibility over medical needs and medical decisions. The living will, if you choose to call it, actually this is the name, the living will of someone has to be treated and this in Portugal is treated through medical channels. This is one. Two, provision of prolonged medical care in Portugal. In theory, is in the hands of the national healthcare system and social security. In practice, those solutions are pretty basic. Uh, the system is just overwhelmed. So if you count with these solutions, you will have to wait a long period of time and then settle for very basic layer of services. And if you want to do it privately, you have to have financial resources for that. You have to have a financial enabler to allow uh, the family, your next of kin, your spouse to support those needs. If everything is thought of, pre-planned, and ready, ready for the rainy day. If this rainy day comes, you will have it all settled. The headaches, the constraints, the hurdles will be tremendously much lesser. Claudia works directly with foreign clients of Serenity Portugal, and we started off by asking her, what is the most common fear that people have? Here's what she said. One thing that's been coming up very uh, frequently is that uh, what, what should I do when I die? If I die, if my, my partner dies, if something happened, what are the legal stuff, the procedures and everything? How much money will I need? So these things are, are starting to come up. This is things that actually we can prepare. We can be ready, we can have strategies, we can have plan A, plan B, plan C. And so this is something that also uh, Serenity can always help with.
Another thing that's been coming up a lot recently is long-term care in Portugal. No matter what your age is, if you are planning on living here the rest of your life, then you want to know what the long-term care is like. We don't have a very solid network. We have uh, the public system, but there are very few providers. They don't have a lot of quality. Uh, they are difficult to access. They have a lot of rules. They have a lot of waiting times. And then we have the private sector with the best facilities, with the best uh, technical uh, personnel and everything. There are a lot, a lot of money. They are very expensive monthly. Another thing to take into consideration is the location of the long-term care facility. They are more in the big city centers. All through the country, they, it's, it's, uh, it's not that often that we have a lot of uh, offers for, for good service. It's more difficult to find someone who speaks English. Uh, the further we go from the bigger city centers, the difficult it is to find someone that speaks English. A caution of hers has to do with checking the legality of the facility. In Portugal, in, unfortunately, we, we can go online and search for a, a facility and say, oh, this is very, it seems very good on the pictures, but sometimes they, are, they don't have a, a legal permit to, to work. This is something that it's not uh, transparent in the institutions in Portugal. She also said you need to be aware of pricing. So is the facility just offering the room and meals or is medicine included as well? To have some quality, I think uh, the, the lower prices are like 1,000 euros to have some quality. But they can range to 4,000 euros or more per month. And some don't have included like medication, if you need diapers, for example. It's not, some, it's not included. It's just the, the, that you are there and you have your meals and you have the staff and you have everything. But if you need medication or need uh, something else, it's, sometimes it's plus that. Claudia gives a reason as to why it's good to be in the public health care system while highlighting why it's also good to have some private health insurance. National healthcare system, it's not an insurance at all. It's a service that is provided by the state, it's managed with, by true taxes, and it's a service that is accessible to all citizens and residents. Of course, if there is an emergency and you go to the public hospital, they will see you. But uh, in case if you have, that you have an il illness, you need to be registered to be seen in the public hospital. But the thing is, is that uh, to be seen in the public hospital, you need to be referred by your uh, uh, physician in uh, uh, the healthcare center, that it's like a, um, a family clinic there is in every region. And uh, you will not know which doctor will be assigned to you. You will not know if he's up to date with the, with the latest research. You don't know if he speaks English. So it will be a challenge. It's good to be on the public system because to be registered because some treatments are very expensive and depending on your, on your on your financial status it's good to be because you always have that plan b but we always consider it to be a plan b and if you can afford insurance it's better to have it because in portugal we have several private hospitals that have research centers for cancer for several types of cancer or degenerative diseases like also Alzheimer's or Parkinson, and uh, to access it, if you have insurance for the long run, it's more safe. The public system, we cannot control it. Sometimes we are depending, depending on it, but more and more the private system is getting solutions, and more and more insurance companies are trying to be competitive so they can cover uh, the client's needs. It was also important for us to speak with her about repatriation in case of death. There's always strategies that you can, uh, you can try to prepare to because uh, we understand that uh, you want to come here and to live here but a lot of our clients are concerned that uh, what happens after because I don't, know, I don't want to be here after I die, I want to, so to speak. I want to go back to my home country, whether it's the States, the UK, the New Zealand. We have clients from all over the world and uh, this is something that may work different from country to country. And it's always something that uh, it's uh, good to understand and the costs that are associated and the strategies that can be uh, done to prepare for this situation, this kind of situation. 
Next, we speak with Nelson, a lawyer who provides us with what the law says in Portugal about these emergency situations. A lawyer can find out if there is a will. With the uh, death certificate, we go to a central office in Lisbon, we show the death certificate, and they will tell us if that person in particular left a, a last will and testament or not. He made it very clear that the will should be done in Portugal. It's also important to say that uh, the will must be done in Portugal because there are a lot of Americans with two wills, one will uh, in the U.S. and another will in Portugal. Here's the first consideration Nelson gives us in regards to a single person when they die. First of all, we need to know if the uh, person that passed away has a will or not. And we need to know if he has children or if he has parents still living, you know, because if he doesn't have children, his parents will become successors, will become the heirs of that person in particular. Nelson has a working knowledge of law in the U.S. because he used to live there before moving back to Portugal, where now he is a lawyer. If the person has a will in the United States, we need to know which attorney uh, was responsible to write, write the uh, last testament in the United States. And sometimes that becomes very, very difficult because no one knows the attorney, no one has a copy of the will. Uh, it's a very difficult mission, very difficult mission, very. Next, we wanted to ask him if the process changes if they have a spouse when they die. They change because a spouse is always an heir. Uh, and the children. What about same-sex marriages? Gay marriage is legalized in Portugal, but for, if for some reason they don't want to get married in Portugal, they sh the partner should come up with a will. If they don't have a will, <laughs> the partner will be not an heir because they're not married. Well, if they become uh, Portuguese citizens, they can use the American marriage and record it here in Portugal. If they're not American and Portuguese citizens, they should get married or come up with a will. Nelson was quick to highlight a difference of inheritance between the U.S. and Portugal. And this is something to look into because it could be different from your home country compared to Portugal. And there's uh, one thing different from the United States. In the United States, a person that has a will uh, can disinherit a son or a daughter without no reason. In Portugal, it's totally different. The law does not allow uh, someone to disinherit a son or, or a daughter, children. Uh, they can only disinherit one-third of the estate, one-third. For example, if a person has a million euros, he can give 300,000 euros to Befica, to a charity institution, to his mistress, whatever but he cannot disinherit the, the children. He only can disinherit the children if the children try to kill their father or their mother in order to get the estate. That is an exclusion. Or if uh, uh, the child is convicted in a court of law by beating up the father or the mother or by calling the father or the mother names. Uh, that's a serious matter, and that excludes that person to receive the estate. But these are exceptional measures. You might be wondering what kind of government support is given to a spouse in case of death. Well, Nelson has said that if you didn't contribute to the Social Security in Portugal, then the pension is not available for you. If they have uh, social, social Security discounts, uh, which a lot of Americans don't have because they moved to Portugal like five, six, seven years ago. Uh, there's no uh, social security benefits for the spouse. Uh, if they uh, come up with contributions to the social security, then there might be a pension. Next, we talk about car accidents and insurance. There is a fund if you get hit by someone who's uninsured, but actually by law, everyone should be insured. Uh, if the car has no insurance, then we apply uh, for the compensation uh, through an institution that the government created. Okay, it's a fund. It's a fund for people that do not have insurance, but they don't want to arm people that have insurance. So 
uh, it's skewed through the fund. But basically speaking, everyone has insurance. It's uh, actually it's a legal obligation to have an insurance. So we participate the accident, and if there is an agreement, they will pay directly uh, to the uh, uh, non-fault uh, person. And uh, if they don't pay, then we have to sue the insurance company, we have to go to court, or we have to establish some kind of negotiation with the insurance company in order to collect the uh, compensation for both damages. In Portugal, there are two legal aspects of a car accident, civil and criminal. We have the uh, killing situation, which is a crime, and uh, the person that uh, committed that crime uh, it's it's not a it's a, it's not a first degree homicide. It's a homicide for negligence, like they call it here in the penal code in Portugal. Homicidio por negligencia doesn't give you jail time. Uh, if you if you, you don't have priors, it's not a problem. And then the insurance has to pay the family for losing that family uh, person. Uh, but it's two aspects: it's the crime aspects and the civil aspect. The civil, it's in terms of compensation. The, crim the criminal side is the criminal because someone killed, not intentionally, it's true, but someone killed uh, someone. What about a car break-in? Call the police immediately because they will come with a report and, uh, and then you file the report to, uh, near the uh, insurance uh, company. There are different policies, coalition, and the policy that covers all the damages, okay? In that, this second possibility applies to your case. Imagine that you, you only have coalition, doesn't apply. It's very difficult, very, very difficult. Uh, one thing is certain, you should report the incident to the police. And the police, they open an investigation. He gave the same advice if your passport or residency card is lost or stolen. Again. Go to the police and say that my wallet was stolen or I lost my wallet, you know, either way. And then they'll give you uh, like a sheet of paper that uh, you filed that, uh, that, that thing. And then you go to CEF to get another one or go to the American Embassy, for example, to get a new passport. Nelson said not to worry about your legal status if your residency card is lost or stolen. Now we have the uh, system computerized, and if they insert your name, they will know automatically if you're legal or not. But just in case, you bring with you uh, the notification, the, the sheet of paper that the police gave you. If you lose your wallet or, you know, or if the wallet is stolen, uh, they're, they're usually quicker. We asked Nelson about his final bits of advice before we talk with a legal financial specialist. I highly recommend that uh, the American citizens should have one will for America and one will in Portugal. It's true that the American wills can be valid in Portugal, but some are not valid in Portugal because they violate the Portuguese law. And if they violate the Portuguese law, they cannot be executed in Portugal. Since he wanted to reiterate the importance of having a will in Portugal, we wanted to find out how hard it is to get your foreign will converted and what that cost would be like. 1,500 euros, maybe 2,000 euros tops, because we have to bring witnesses, uh, we have to pay to the New Republic, because the wills in Portugal uh, cannot be sealed by an attorney like in the United States. This is uh, an exclusive competence of the notary public in Portugal. The attorney prepares, writes, but the uh, formalization of the will, it's up to the notary public. When an American client comes to me, what I do is, do you have a will in the U.S.? Yes, I do. Please show me the will so I can review it and see if the will can be executed in Portugal. If not, I say, listen, it's better for you to take care of another will in Portugal. So before anything else, we need to review the American will. Igor provided us with some very sharp and valuable information in these emergency situations. We have a funeral cost that is like the 
immediately, but we also have the legal costs after the death that we have to take care and can be like 5 to 10% of what we have. By the money that we have, the, the things like the, uh, the houses, the, we, we need a, a lawyer to take care of that kind of issue. So we have to pay the lawyer. So we, the way that we are treating that, we make like um, life insurance to guarantee that when the people die, the family have the money to take care of that. Normally, 10% of the old uh, actives that, uh, the, um, and the money that the people have. If you're worried about a death tax, then Igor's words are encouraging. It's not for the government, okay? It's exp expenses that we will have to, to, to take care of all the, the legal issues. Yeah, not that sec. Portugal is very small country. So only if we want to, to live to other persons outside of our family. To our family, we don't have taxes of, for that in Portugal. For kids or for our parents, we don't pay any tax. So how much is a funeral? A normal funeral could be uh, less expensive, like 5,000 euros. But if you have like a big funeral, it could be like 25, 30, 35,000 uh, euros. Most of the people are uh, make normal funerals, so between 5,000 and 10,000 will be enough for, to take care of that. Since we talked a little bit about car accidents, we wanted to ask Igor how that gets paid out. He said that if you're at fault, then it gets a little difficult. If you, you are not the guilty one, okay, you will receive it something from the other guy, okay? Your family will receive it but if, you, if you die, but if you are disabled, they also will pay you something. Okay, the problem is if you are the guilty person, because sometimes we go look at the phone, other times we look at other, other things, so we, we are a lot of distractors nowadays. So if the guilty is us, we are the guilty ones, will be difficult uh, for us because we have to pay. The insurance will pay most of the things, but not for us, for the other persons, okay? Here in Portugal, we have like a responsibility insurance in the cars that uh, take care of the other part, the third part, not for us. For us, you will have a, a problem. If you don't have any life insurance or uh, accident insurance, you also have to have it. It's like in the US or, or around the world. But in Portugal, it's not common, okay? The people don't have don't like to have insurance, but they are, very, they are needed, so... Uh, Here's Igor's major advice about planning in advance. It will be less expensive, you will be everything pro programmed, you will, like, the people that you want that to receive the money will receive the money, but if you play, like, if you can plan in the, the moment, it's not a plan, it's action. So it will be very, very, very difficult in Portugal. Igor and Nelson were extremely on board with this last piece of advice that even Portuguese people don't get right with the passing of a loved one. The people will, the, the accounts will be blocked, the bank accounts will be blocked, so they have to have help. If the person that passed away has bank accounts, uh, if the bank knows that that person passed away, the account will be automatically blocked. So before anything else, if you need money for uh, funeral expenses and other uh, immediate expenses, they should remove the money, withdraw the money before letting the bank know that the person passed away. In order to legalize the bank account afterwards, there are a couple of uh, legal formalities to comply with. The heirs deed, that's the first thing, and the second thing is to file the death of that person at the IRS department. And all the heirs need to have a Portuguese tax ID number. Without the Portuguese tax ID number, they cannot do anything in Portugal. It's like the social security number in the United States. Works the same way. Which is Número de Identificação Fiscal. That's the name of it uh, for Portuguese. As soon as possible. Because there is a deadline of three months to file the passing at the IRS department. If you want to see someone who has used Serenity, then check out this video right here. And if you want to get a 20% off discount with Serenity, then use this code also in the description. Good until the end of April 2023. Now let's get moving.